Welcome everybody to Gut Check Project episode number 39, a super cool one because my co-host is also our guest, the expert, the person that we all love whenever Eric goes out of town on a mountain biking expedition, which is what he's doing right now. So we have the super smart, super well-trained Dr. Stuart Ackerman as both our expert guest and our host, Dr. Ackerman. Thanks for coming. Oh, thanks for uh, having me here. I was more than happy to pay for Eric's vacation so that I can do this. <laughs> you are pretty sly like that. That's pretty interesting. You're sort of, uh, you're sort of uh, pushing him out. And so I think that's, uh, you know, he thinks he's well, having fun. He, it, I made him think it was out. his idea. I mean, that, that was really what it came down to. <laughs> well, in today's episode, this is really cool because when I said that, that Dr. Ackerman is both the co-host today and our expert, it's because we're going to tackle a topic that a lot of people have. And it is diarrhea, specifically related to something called EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And you're like, huh, I saw a commercial on that. What's that? Exactly. That's what all my patients say. They're like, what is this? They come in and talk about this. So usually whenever Eric and I, before we start, Dr. Ackerman, what is going on with you and the Ackerman family? Anything personal you want to share? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I can share all kinds of things. Um, it's been uh, definitely interesting in uh, the quarantine life as we uh, now gear up at the end of the summer trying to figure out what to do with the kids. Uh, kids are sort of excited to go back to school, not sure what they're going to do, but uh, I never thought they'd have this problem that they've actually watched all there is to watch on TV and they need something else to do. That reminds me of, I think I saw some funny video where somebody was sitting in front of, in front of his computer and it goes, you've done it. You've reached the end of the internet. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of like that. There's nothing I mean, more. You can only have so many subscriptions, I guess. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Well, in the Brown household, I took Lucas to a tournament, pretty cool, um, in Wichita Falls. It, it was a well-run tournament, so kudos to the tournament director out there. It was a college tournament, so Lucas uh, unfortunately lost in a tough third set tie break to uh, – a really good player and you know we just kind of move on and we got so excited to talk about what he learned from that and then by the time we got back to Dallas they had canceled the national tournament which is why he was doing this to prepare for the next one and so um, uh, we're dealing with that where we try and make plans and keep these the passion up so and you know when we were talking the other night I actually realized after we hung up that I wanted to ask Lucas I mean I know that it's a junior tournament so there's no betting and things like that, but there must be some sort of handicapping system, right? Because there are rankings. Where was he ranked in comparison to this kid who's several years older than him? Well, this was actually a college tournament. So it was for college players. And so he's 15, he played a 21 year old and actually Lucas on ranking level is what they were both on par. So the two he's Lucas was the number one seed in the tournament and that man was the second, was the number two seed. So it worked out perfect. The bracket got the, what I consider the two best players to play in the end. Right. And um, funny you bring that up because him and I were in Panama uh, right when COVID hit because we had to bust out of Panama. He was doing what's called an ITF. And I happen to have a friend there in Panama who lives uh, there and has been doing sort of digital marketing and all this stuff. And he was running a betting website and he goes, it's nuts. He goes, people from around the world will bet on anything. And then we started talking tennis. And he goes, the most rigged sport, like, for betting, where people, like, there's all kinds of junior-level sports that people bet on because they know that they can kind of tilt the odds one way or the oh other. Oh, my gosh. There's, yeah, it was a whole new world for me. So, like, when you say <laughs> that, I kind of cringe because I was just like, oh, no. You know, <laughs> we've got – we're going to start, like, hustling, uh, you know, peewee baseball and stuff like that. Yeah, I, apologize. No, I just thought about how he, he took, a, you know, someone who's, I think, five years or six years older than him to the brink and almost beat him, Yeah, but has such a competitive spirit to be upset by that. Oh, totally upset. Like, on the way home, just, you know, I had two match, but he had two match points. I had two match points. I just don't, if I just would have, you know, I'm like, I know, I know. It's, it's life. <laughs> and what's really cool is that, you know, you move on and do that. So I apologize a little bit if I'm a little nasally. I do not know what blew into town, but it is killing my allergies today. So, and I, 
it's not COVID. I smell great. All those other things. I don't smell great, but I can still smell things. Smell things. Smell things. So let's get back at this. So before everybody's like, well, they're just going to talk about their family the whole time. I want to reiterate something. So we stole Dr. Ackerman four years ago, three years ago, five years ago. Holy cow. Time passes fast. We stole him from New York because he is a specially trained expert in advanced endoscopy. So he does the things that most of us have not been trained in. And a lot of that involves the pancreas. So you and I got to talking and we had a patient recently who um, showed up to, to have her endoscopy done. And she said, Hey, do I have this? And I called you in and you looked at that. And I'm like, EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. I'm like, man, if these drug companies are spending so much time uh, advertising for it, we better just address this head on and let's just have an episode. You're a pancreas expert. I'm more of a luminologist is how I like to consider myself. And so the lumen, I like colons and I like stomachs and, um, and hemorrhoids, but you are an advanced trained person that everybody, if you have a pancreas, call up Dr. Ackerman and make sure that your pancreas is okay. So, you know, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. So this is definitely something that's getting a lot of press and, you know, if you look around uh, TV, internet, I mean, it feels like the ads are just constantly jumping at you. And it's uh, something that it gives everyone pause that has diarrhea. And, you know, there are different estimates, but uh, more than 5%, in a conservative estimate, more than 5% of the population deals with chronic diarrhea in some form. And, you know, 5% is a lot of people and not everyone gets to the bottom of what's going on with them and gets that relief and that, uh, that feeling that they know exactly what it is and how to deal with it. And for years, pretty much we knew about inflammatory bowel disease and knew how to evaluate for it and rule it out. And then it was kind of a short list, you know, well, we look for what we have. You don't have any of that. You probably have IBS. Oh, the famous, you probably have IBS. So that's my world where everybody comes, says, I have IBS. And if you're somebody, if you're 20% of the population that suffers from irritable bowel syndrome, it can be diarrhea, constipation, or mixed. And you may be one of those frustrated people that you go into your doctor, you have an endoscopy, a colonoscopy, and some blood work, you get pat on the head and you go, good news, it's just IBS. You leave and you're still miserable. And I think that's why there's so many commercials going on here where it's like, look, maybe we're not thinking hard enough on some of the stuff. My world is SIBO, bacterial overgrowth. Your world is pancreas. And so that's why you're the expert on this. And so let's do, let's not make this too sciencey. I know that, uh, we all, you're still in the office. I love that. You just got done doing telemedicine. And um, if anybody, uh, doc, go to Dr. Ackerman's website, set up a telemedicine visit if you're concerned about this, because he's the expert. So let's hop right in. I'm going to start interviewing you less as a co-host, more as an expert. So um, what is your standard workup? I'm going to start from the beginning on diarrhea. Somebody comes in and said, I've, I've had diarrhea for two weeks. Do you care? Do you like that? Do you call that chronic diarrhea versus the person that says I buy diarrhea for a year? Right. So that's actually a great way to start the question because what makes something chronic? And it seems to be accepted that if it's four weeks or longer, you're dealing with chronic diarrhea. So the first thing I want to do when a patient comes in, I want to get a sense of what this means to them. When they say they have diarrhea, that means 10 different things to 10 different people. And that could be part of the reason why it's so difficult to get the right workup. It's, it's trying to fit a square peg into a circle hole. And you got to make sure that everything lines up. So one of the most important things to do is get a sense from the patient, what's bothering them? What does it mean to them? Are you saying you have diarrhea because your stools are loose? Are you saying you have diarrhea because you go 10 times a day? How does it work? Is it when you eat? If you don't eat, you're fine. Do you go no matter what? Do you wake up five times a night to go to the bathroom, even though nothing else has been going on? These are things that you can tease out that might send you along different paths in the workup. And when you say tease out, that's the art of somebody that understands their craft really well. This is why we can still do telemedicine and be effective because that history, the patient history tells a story. You have become a detective. And you're going to get to the bottom of this. All those questions you just asked, 
are all things. Have you traveled? Has this happened? Do you wake up at night? Those are all the same things I ask. So you start kind of moving to this area. So, all right. So I'm going to play patient. I'm going to say, I've had this for six months. Um, I don't wake up. I use the restroom afterwards and I just feel like I'm not absorbing things. Right. So that is definitely a classic paradigm for EPI. And, you know, I think it's important that we kind of define what that means, that you have exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. I thought about it this morning and I was trying to think about what would be a good way to explain it that would really resonate with our viewers as to how you might have EPI. I think, I think the classic reason to have it is you burnt out your pancreas. You have chronic pancreatitis. The pancreas is very scarred. It can't work. I think it's very easy to understand that if your pancreas is impaired in some way, that the function of it isn't going to be that great either. So let me, but, let me stop you right there because we're going to get into that in a second because we're going to start with step one. Step one is you're a pancreas expert. Why are people using this acronym EPI? Because the pancreas does a lot of really important things. It has the endocrine function and it has an exocrine function. Define what those two are. Sure. So the endocrine function is essentially your insulin. So if your endocrine function is impaired, that means you have a low insulin level. And that's actually what type 1 diabetes is, right? You're not making enough insulin. So the answer is, how do you fix that? Take insulin, right? If your pancreas can't produce it for you, you can take it and essentially help it out. That's the endocrine side. The exocrine side, when we talk about pancreatic exocrine insufficiency, is related more to uh, direct digestion of carbohydrates, fats, and to some degree proteins. Um, and those are what are called lipases, proteases, and, uh, and amylases. And there are varying concentrations of each of them that are uh, spit out by the pancreas in response to stimulus, which is eating. So I eat something, I eat a hamburger, I've got bun, meat, cheese, eat it, swallow it. Well, that's you. I yeah. wouldn't have cheese in there, <laughs> but that's me. But so we've got uh, protein, fat, and carbs. And through really beautiful complex signaling, the pancreas then releases these digestive enzymes. Correct. Known as the exocrine portion of it. Correct. Okay. So exocrine portion. So if I have an exocrine insufficiency, meaning maybe I'm not putting out enough enzyme. Right. So either you're not putting out enough or maybe you're not getting to the point of the bowel where you would do that. For instance, in surgical procedures that bypass the area where you would spit out the exocrine uh, pancreatic enzymes, uh, you'll end up with an insufficiency, which essentially boils down to a maldigestive disorder. So a malabsorption. So people do, are not getting these nutrients. So we've got an exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, EPI. So when I do my workup and I go, you know, uh, Dr. Ackerman, it looks like there's some unusual things going on with this patient that I think I need your assistance with. They are low on their vitamin K, their vitamin E, uh, their vitamin D. They've got, they're describing oily stools. That is how I've been classically taught what EPI is. What the commercials are saying is they're casting a broad net. They're like, if you've got right. bloating, abdominal cramping, and change in bowel habits, ask your doctor about EPI. And I'm going to close this out as to why I think they're casting such a broad net in the end, but we're going to still talk about the physiology, pathophysiology. So it sounds a lot like irritable bowel syndrome, these commercials. Right. Right. And, and there's tons of overlap. So if I had to say, what's the single, the largest diagnosis or the largest swath of patients with a specific diagnosis that are going to overlap, it's going to be irritable bowel, right? You're bloated, you're gassy, you're having loose stools, you don't quite feel good after you eat. These are all signs of both irritable bowel because of a sensitivity issue when you eat, uh, but also 
a malabsorptive dis, uh, issue at the same time. So those symptoms alone won't quite make it. What you alluded to is someone who has fairly advanced disease so that when they eat, they really aren't producing any enzymes. So everything's gonna come out in particular fat. So those fat soluble vitamins, A, D, E, and K, are gonna be more susceptible to deficiencies. And you'll actually sometimes see what looks like fat or oil droplets in the bowl with the stool because you can't absorb the fat appropriately. Yeah, exactly. I, and this isn't just an issue of a gastroenterologist. When I was looking this up, I got on YouTube to see like what uh, other people have said about this. And my friend and author, Rob Wolf, he, he was doing a whole thing, a Q&A, and that was a question. I'm seeing all these commercials coming up on this right. on his YouTube channel. He was like, this is coming up a whole lot. And so he addressed the exact same thing and discussed the endocrine, the exocrine. So shout out to him for taking that on because um, it's, it's clearly reaching the masses right now. Right. So we just want to demystify this, talk about now we know what the symptoms are, which can be pretty broad. Uh, let's talk about some causes. So you were getting into the causes before. So let's talk about causes of what can actually cause true exocrine pancreatic insufficiency. And then we'll talk about uh, non-pancreatic causes and then talk about diagnosis and then ultimately the treatment. Sound fair? Right. All right. Yeah, that sounds great. So pancreatic causes, probably the, the single biggest cause would be chronic pancreatitis. So chronic pancreatitis is an issue where you start laying down scar tissue within the pancreas. And, you know, it doesn't in general happen overnight. I mean, you could theoretically get uh, a major inflammatory episode or a trauma uh, that, that could really give your pancreas a hit all in one fell swoop. But in general, this is something that happens over time. It's kind of like laying the, 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 the groundwork and the scaffolding and eventually it keeps building up. Uh, so so it didn't, why you, know, you, you, you deal with the pancreas, you deal with pancreatitis. What is pancreatitis and why do I care about that? So there's two kinds of pancreatitis. There's acute pancreatitis and chronic pancreatitis, and they're not the same thing. And they're often confused and they're actually distinct entities. They can relate to each other, but the mechanisms are different. When you have severe pain and you show up to an emergency room and they do a CAT scan and tell you, oh, you got acute pancreatitis, what that means is your pancreas is inflamed. It might be swollen. There's a lot of fluid around it. It's an inflammatory process. But when you have chronic pancreatitis, chronic pancreatitis means that it's scarred, it's shriveled. The word they use a lot of times is atrophy or sometimes calcification. Now, you can have both. You can have chronic pancreatitis and have a pancreas that's a little bit shriveled and then gets inflamed. And we call that acute on chronic pancreatitis. And it may make your threshold to get acute pancreatitis a lot lower. And people that have ever had this are nodding going, that's not fun at right. all. Pancreatitis is a very serious issue. Yeah, we don't wish it upon anybody. No, not upon anybody. Okay, so that's what pancreatitis is. Um, as a gastroenterologist that deals in this, what, what are some of the causes of chronic pancreatitis? Actually, I think that, I mean, acute and chronic, the causes are the same. It's just the repetitive of insults, correct? Uh, for the most part, I'd say, um, you know, the, the two most common causes for acute pancreatitis in America are alcohol and gallstones. And if you continue to get, like you said, if you continue to get acute injuries, acute pancreatitis, you're going to keep developing more and more scars as a result, and you'll end up with chronic pancreatitis. Uh, I'd say one thing that has not really been shown to cause acute pancreatitis, but is uh, very much in the conversation for chronic pancreatitis is smoking. Uh, we have patients who have chronic smoking over time, never had an acute pancreatitis episode ever develop EPI or chronic abdominal pain and in the process of the workup are found to have chronic pancreatitis. And the wow. only risk factor they have is, is chronic smoking. That's something that I've never actually come across in literature. Do you have an etiology of why you think smoking does that? So it's tough to say, but I mean, we do know that 
uh, physiologically, smoking does lead to scar. It's been seen in, in many organs. Hold on, let me write this down. So smoking is not good for you. Is that what you're saying? I, I think it's uh, something I'm pretty comfortable putting my stamp on as a physician. Wow. I mean, we're uh, in a really political environment. You better, be, <laughs> you better feel strong about it. Yeah, I don't know. I don't want any of the big tobacco companies coming after <laughs> me. But <laughs> I'd say from a, from a medical perspective, um, there's not much good that comes from it. <laughs> okay, so mostly from just the inflammatory process. It seems to be. It okay. seems to be. Uh, but it's been it's been linked to many cancers and various organs that are unrelated to each other and uh, chronic scar. Uh, we've seen that too, uh, and the pancreas being one of them. Okay, so pancreatitis of uh, the acute can lead to chronic, correct? Mm-hmm. So if you have an acute episode, you may end up with a slightly chronic one. If you continue to drink or smoke, you can end up developing this. Are there any other disease states related to chronic pancreatitis? So there's a, there's a viral states. Uh, we, we have something called tropical pancreatitis, not really seen so much in North America, uh, more, more seen in the, in the Eastern countries. Um, one of the uh, autoimmune disease, uh, the pancreas is one of the organs that can be affected by autoimmune disease. Uh, so patients who already have one autoimmune disease, be that autoimmune thyroid disease, rheumatoid arthritis, or other arthritis, um, are always more susceptible to getting a second autoimmune disease and uh, the pancreas and sometimes the liver are the ones that we deal with. Um, and then actually uh, high triglyceride levels. That's actually the number three. Uh, oh, it's, really? a, it's a distant third in comparison to the first two, but that's the uh, third most common reason for uh, recurrent pancreatitis is hypertriglyceridemia or high triglyceride levels. And you know, I'm not talking like, you know, you got a little bit of an elevation and your doc tells you you probably should cut down on the fast food and maybe exercise a little more, but significantly elevated, sometimes in the thousands. So my experience has been, and you've seen so much more of this, but it seems like these are young people with a some sort of genetic issue and they have these hypertriglyceridemia and it's usually really bad that first episode. Have you yeah. seen similar episodes or similar findings? Yeah, and occasionally it's so bad that we actually have to do almost a dialysis type procedure to get the triglycerides out of their blood just so that it stops inflaming their pancreas and they can get over it. And then from there, we can try medications to keep it down. But yeah, sometimes it's just so overworked that they're just in the throes of it and we just have to break that cycle. And then the last thing is that I have a large uh, inflammatory bowel disease population, Crohn's disease, and it has been associated with that. Is that just part of the autoimmune process that you were just yeah, talking about? Yeah, it seems to be that there's some, some part of the autoimmune cascade there because we do know, you know, as much as we know so much about Crohn's disease, there's so much that we don't know, but uh, it's, it's fairly clear at this point that there's an autoimmune component in addition to environmental ones. And uh, it's possible that that overlap is, is where the elevated pancreatitis risk comes because we do see what's called IgG mediated, which is another way of saying autoimmune uh, disorders of the pancreas and bile ducts and liver in relation to Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. The infamous before you arrive, Dr. Goldschmidt, make sure you check an IgG4 on that person. Yeah. The subtype that could potentially affect the pancreas. There's some method to it. Yeah. All right. So um, now I'm worried. Um, I've got some, I smoked a cigarette yesterday. I uh, had a, had a drink with my buddies. I go poop and my, my stool is floating. It, this is kind of a trick question. Um, is that pancreatic insufficiency? Yeah, not necessarily. I mean, everyone's entitled to have floating poops every once in a while. <laughs> uh, more commonly, it's actually related to just some gas that's uh, stuck in the stool, and therefore it's not truly as solid as it may look, and it's floating. Any kind of you know, uh, malabsorptive issue, even if it's transient, like something you ate that you didn't quite digest well, or maybe you had a passing viral illness can cause very similar symptoms. So the chronicity establishing that this has been going on is a really major piece of the puzzle before you go down that road to worry about it. So I throw that out there because I was traveling and I got called by some men's health or something. Hey, we're doing this article on, on stools. 
uh, we want you to comment on what does floating stools mean. So I had to like sit in an airport, you know, log into their Wi-Fi and then like type this response and it was about air. And because of that, I came across an article when, when we were preparing for this EPI that um, a very fun, I call this my fun stool fact. It's that many people believe that floating stools is related to pancreatic insufficiency or malabsorption. The reality is stools sticking to the toilet bowl have been more associated with steatorrhea or more lipid or more you're passing oil or fats. Right. So I thought yeah, that was kind of funny. Grease is adherent yeah. to the bowl. Isn't that funny? Yeah. So I have all these patients go, I saw my stool floating. And I'm like, okay, that's right. All right. So I'm curious to know what your Google searches look like now that you did that in a, uh, in an airport. Oh, forget about the Google searches. You got to see the ads I'm getting. I mean, <laughs> I'm being haunted by some really scary ads right now, but, uh, good, good digital marketers to profile me and then track me down. So, so we know what pancreatic insufficiency is. Um, I want to know, are there some other things that can cause similar looking symptoms before I make an appointment with Dr. Stuart Ackerman to really determine if I have this? So are there non-pancreatic causes that can do stuff like this? Yeah. And that's the idea we talk about, um, when you see uh, when you see any kind of provider about building what's called a differential diagnosis, a differential diagnosis being these are the all the things in the realm of possibility that might be going on and we need to have a plan of attack to figure out which ones make more sense and which ones don't and in this situation you got to think about ibs you got to think about celiac disease you got to think about bile salt diarrhea uh, then there's your sort of very random ones like neuroendocrine tumors um, IBD doesn't really play in usually in most cases, but if you have some mild Crohn's disease of the small bowel and maybe essentially causing a malabsorptive problem, the symptoms might overlap. And that's where the art of medicine really comes in. You know, rather than saying, well, why don't we just test for everything and see what sticks, you really sit there and take everything into account of your patient so that you can make a more focused differential diagnosis. How often are they going? What does it look like? Is it waking them up at night? What medications are they taking? Is there something new or different that might be causing a problem? Have they recently traveled? And you take all that into the hopper and see what comes out. Yeah, that is an absolutely great answer. So there are non-pancreatic causes. So if you're having something like this, go to a very experienced board certified gastroenterologist to ask all those questions. And figure out where we're at. Okay, so now the patient's seen you, you've asked the questions, you're still very suspicious. What do you do with the patient then if you're still concerned that this could be EPI, exocrine pancreatic insufficiency? So nowadays, there's actually a really nice, really easy test that you can do as sort of your gateway um, for EPI evaluation, and that's called a pancreatic elastase. It's actually a stool study uh, to sort of say it in a, in a quick, blunt way. If your pancreas is working, you should be making so much excess enzyme that you should be pooping it out. And we would love to test that. And basically, you send a stool sample, they check for this pancreatic elastase, and your levels should be really, really high if things are working well. You should be doing so well, you, you, you're, you're pancreatic elastase rich. But... If that number is coming down, if that number is lower, that's a sign that you're just not functioning appropriately. You're not able to produce enough to meet demand. And that's where the concern for EPI comes in. So a couple of things I love about that. Number one, you said we would love to test that. So for everybody listening, when you see a gastroenterologist and you go, oh, I'm so embarrassed about talking about this. No, we love to hear that. Because when you go, doc, I don't want to, I'm super embarrassed, but when I go poop, it looks like you poured olive oil in there. I'm like, yes. Do you have a picture of it? It's awesome. Let's talk about that. So when you say we love to test that, the beauty of elastase, the test that um, researchers have figured out is that it remains essentially intact. Elastase one remains intact through the digestive process. So your pancreas puts it out and you can look at that. So when you're low, you're definitely low. It's not like your body's absorbing it. 
It's that it should be in the stool, one particular part of the elastase. So pancreatic elastase, that's awesome because for boards, meaning like when all of us take our uh, medicine boards, they always ask the really hard questions like, hey, you're worried about chronic pancreatitis. Um, should you do these other invasive tests? So you've been trained in all these invasive tests. One of the few doctors in the DFW Metroplex that have, I think there's just a handful or well, however many of you guys exist, which are the advanced adoxibus have actually been taught this stuff. So in case you're at an academic center, in case you get an elastase, which is up, is there ever a reason to do one of these invasive tests? So if the elastase is up, that's normal. Or, I'm sorry. Right? Low. Yeah, low. Yeah. So just to, just to clarify that. So if it's up, that's where you want to be, right? Like I said, you want to be elastase rich. But if it's low, because the most common reason for EPI is chronic pancreatitis, and often on the standard cross-sectional imaging studies like CT scan and MRI, the only way they're really diagnosing chronic pancreatitis is if you have some of the signs of full-blown advanced pancreatitis, like shriveling of your pancreas or calcification. So if you don't have those, it just means that you, we know you don't have advanced chronic calcific pancreatitis, but it's a spectrum of disease. And we don't know if you've got mild or moderate disease just based on an MRI or CT. And that's where endoscopic ultrasound comes in. Because endoscopic ultrasound, where we use an endoscopy with an ultrasound probe attached to the bottom, allows us to look at the pancreas from the inside, sort of to get almost. So right let me clarify here. So you've got our standard endoscopic equipment, and on the very end, a very really cool, special, tiny ultrasound. So if you have ever had an ultrasound on your gallbladder from the outside, or if you've ever had a baby and they ultrasound, you're taking an ultrasound inside the body, which is really right. cool. I yeah. mean, you say it a lot more eloquently than I do. I usually just say it's a uh, endoscope with a little nubbin on the tip. That's an ultrasound. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, the reason why is I think you always downplay this particular aspect, but even me as a gastroenterologist, I call you up all the time and I say, hey, I've got this. Does this warrant an endoscopic ultrasound? And I would do that with some other partners in our group, Dr. Goldschmidt, Dr. Bob Anderson. Um, people like that where I'm like, hey, I have a young man for no reason developed pancreatitis. Does it warrant an ultrasound? And the reason why I bring this up, because a lot of people never talk about this, it's a very relatively safe, non-invasive procedure compared to other things to do. Yeah, when I speak to patients, I, I pretty much tell them the risk profile is no different than having a regular endoscopy. There's no risk to your pancreas from the ultrasound waves. They're just sonic waves. So we don't have to worry that by evaluating, we could potentially cause trouble. Yeah. So when I see these commercials, ask your doctor about EPI, the next thing they should say is either I'm going to learn about EPI or I'm just going to send them to Dr. Ackerman so that he can figure out if it's something that needs an EUS or not. Yeah. And I love talking about it. I you know, it's not to say that every single person who walks into the office and says, do I have EPI? I'm going to go say, well, let's run the gamut. Let's do every test. Let's figure it out. You need an endoscopic ultrasound before I can answer that. I'm going to sit there and talk to the patient and get a sense of, is this diarrhea or not? Because probably one of the more common scenarios is they don't actually have diarrhea. They might have some mild bowel habit changes that to them feels like it's diarrhea, but you can tease out right away, maybe it's a supplement. Maybe they're taking a sugar substitute that doesn't agree with them and they're malabsorbing it. And if by pulling that out, all of a sudden, magically, their stools are better. You know, there's not, not every time is the diarrhea warranting of this large workup. But the flip side to that is, patients who have carried this diagnosis of IBS for years, well before we had good endoscopic ultrasound, well before we had pancreatic elastase and some of the other stool tests that we use nowadays, it might be that in 1995, that was the best we could do to say, hey, you have IBS. And now in 2020, we have a lot, of, lot more tools at our disposal to maybe fine tune that and get them 
the right diagnosis and therefore a better treatment regimen that's going to make them feel better. Absolutely. So I have these people that come in and we, I ask all those same questions and we go through that. Did the, did it, you have a significant change? Remember that some of the other non pancreatic things like bacterial overgrowth, SIBO can actually cause steatorrhea also. So now this kind of comes to the point of, okay, we've talked about what it is. We've looked at how to diagnose it. And now I'm, I'm, my question to you, because I'm obviously biased and it's a leading question here, why are the drug companies spending? I'm going to say, I mean, we advertise and I know what it costs to advertise. I'm going to say tens of millions of dollars saying, ask your doctor about EPI. Why are they doing that? Well, I mean, you know, yeah, it's a leading question. <laughs> uh, you know, there's money to be made, all right? Anytime there's money to be made. Um, but I think one of the biggest reasons is, is that it's been so low key and underdiagnosed for so long that the potential for a patient base that doesn't even know they exist is, I don't want to say infinite because there's only so many people, but it's vast. So all these people who may never have been brought to get one of these pancreatic enzyme replacements and therefore not spend money on a therapy that potentially could help them, all of a sudden now the, the, the curtains are drawn, right? The, the doors are open and they have this whole new potential patient base to, to help. Absolutely. Much like celiac disease where we said, oh, it's so rare. And then we realized, oh, no, we went from, you know, 0.04% of the population to 1% to, oh, possibly 3% and so on and so on. So I agree with that. I also did a little experiment here. Um, the, pancre the pharmaceutical pancreatic enzymes, which are available, can be a little expensive. And that's something that I think it needs to be addressed here because if doctors go, oh, this sounds like, I think my opinion is that these commercials are drawn to say, if you have change in bowel habit, bloating, talk to your doctor about EPI. That's a loaded question. You're telling the patient to drive the doctor and say, well, I don't know, what the heck, let's try it. So on GoodRx, if you pay cash, the starting dose of the major uh, pancreatic enzymes, which are porcine and bovine derived, meaning pig and or cow derived, this was a little shocking to me. It's basically about averages to about $10 per pill. So if you start out the starting dose, that's going to be $2,700 a month. If you go to the maximum dose, that's going to be $5,400 a month. Cash price, lots of things involved. Fortunately, we both work with these companies and they do amazing jobs of trying to give um, uh, refunds and things like that. So kudos to that. I'm a little bit scared that they're going to get a bunch of uh, doctors that knee jerk and say, we'll try this and see what happens. That's one of my issues. Yeah. So I do think it's important to have a diagnosis to be working with rather than the let's throw it at them and see if it works approach uh, specifically for that purpose, because it's expensive. But if you know that it's going to get your patient the symptom relief that they need, you're going to fight for that patient. You're going to talk to their insurance company. You're going to talk to the pharmaceutical company. They do, like you mentioned, they do have robust programs for patient assistance, but that doesn't cover everybody. If you're going to them and saying, hey, I want to see if it works, it's going to be hard to justify spending $2,000 a month on that. But if you go to them and say, hey, this lady has a pancreatic elastase that's super low. She's got all the right symptoms. On imaging, it looks like her pancreas doesn't quite look right. She's got mild or moderate chronic pancreatitis. This is your patient. This is the patient that's going to derive benefit from your drug. They want that because it does cut both ways, right? You have a patient that does really well. That patient is going to tell everyone about how awesome they're doing on this drug because they got the right diagnosis that's going to help them just as much as any marketing they do on Facebook or Google. Yeah, absolutely. Now I'm going to ask you a question that the, I don't think there's an answer because I tried to look, this is more of a um, opinion. Uh, I get asked all the time by my patients. Um, well, you want me to try this? I, I do a lot of sampling of pancreatic enzymes because mm -hmm. I believe that there are other, these extra pancreatic causes, which can actually affect your, pancreatic enzymes. 
and they will say, oh, I'm already on this life extension digestive enzyme. Look, here's the label. It has, it says it has lipase, says it has tryptase, says it has amylase. I have contacted them. I have contacted the pharmaceutical companies and I'm like, can you please give me a statement to define plant-based uh, digestive enzymes versus the pharmaceutical bovine and or porcine. Have you ever thought about that before? So I have, and I can't answer it. It's going gonna, it's gonna to sound like I'm skirting the issue. The, the short answer is I can't. But what I can say that I've seen with many of these, when patients come to me and say, oh, I have this naturally derived one that I'm using, very often the amount of enzyme that they're taking is significantly lower than what we know they need. So we talk about standard dosing in the order of thousands, 70,000, 100,000 units with each meal. And in many of these, they'll show me, yeah, I'm taking a handful of capsules and each capsule has a thousand or 3,000 units. So they're getting significantly underdosed. And this is not unique to, to, to say, oh, you know, plant-based ones are just uh, not quite as strong as some of the other ones that are produced by the pharmaceutical companies. I get this from second opinion and third opinion patients sometimes who say, I have chronic pancreatitis, I have pancreatic insufficiency, the enzymes don't work for me, what am I doing wrong? And Eight out of 10 times, nine out of 10 times, the answer is really simple. You're underdosed. Great because answer. we're not trained as, as, as patients to think I need to take six or eight or 10 pills a day for this problem. We want the one pill or the one pill twice a day. And that's how we're conditioned to think is a standard regimen, which is true of most medications. But in this situation, because the problem is every time you eat, you malabsorb, you need to take something every time you eat. And if we gave you the correct amount of enzyme in one capsule, you'd choke on it because it would be huge. <laughs> so we got to break it down and give you smaller capsules, but it's just math. So you got to take enough capsules to give you the amount of enzyme you need with each meal. That is great. That is a great answer. All right, Dr. Ackerman, I think that we have taken on a pretty big topic and done it in a relatively quick, um, expeditious manner. I want to thank you so much for taking the time. Where can people contact you? Because they're right now going, I have that. There's somebody sitting on a toilet, eating a hamburger, smoking a cigarette, going, it's sticking to the bowl. Oh, man. But living life. <laughs> <laughs> How do they find you? So the easiest way is to go through my website. It's uh, www.stuartackermanmd.com, S-T-U-A-K-E-R-M-A-N-M-D.com. And there's a, an appointment tab and a contact us tab. Either one works great. And uh, my staff will get the uh, request and contact you right away. And I will say that uh, we are part of a great group, Digestive Health Associates of Texas, and we funnel, um, or at least in this area, everyone funnels these tough cases, Dr. Ackerman, and you're obviously getting a great idea of his personality and he treats all his patients phenomenally, but is also endoscopically uh, fantastic. I want to do a quick shout out. Once again, I mentioned him earlier, but Rob Wolf, um, author, uh, podcaster, and uh, influencer, he, uh, I love that he did a whole episode on EPI, but more than that, I want to shout out to him because my son at this tournament in Wichita Falls, it was 103 degrees. The heat index was 110. And my son uses his LMNT element electrolytes while he's out there hitting. So maybe that's one of the reasons why a 15-year-old is taking on a 21-year-old. So thank you, at Rob Wolf. And finally, go to kbmdhealth.com. Download a free understanding your endocannabinoid system, even if you don't want to understand that. The reason why is because then we can stay in touch. And you can ask questions uh, like this, like, hey, can you ask Dr. Ackerman, should I be worried that there's pancreatic cancer in my family? Hey, can you ask so-and-so? We have access to experts. We can do this. Can you ask Rob Wolf? I want to do a keto diet. What do I do with this? So these are ways to stay in touch. We want to interact 
Um, as always, whenever we mention anything, we're two doctors, but we are not your doctor. So this is for advice, for entertainment. If you do have any of these issues, please discuss with your doctor. We are not giving medical advice. And finally, much love to everyone that listens to this, watches this, and please share, like, um, do a little thumbs up on wherever it's supposed to happen, uh, like all the podcast um, platforms. So all in all, I think this is a, a great way to clarify something that has been very vague in the mainstream media. Thank you once again, Dr. Ackerman. Thanks for having me. Bye, everybody. Stay safe.